Hey, what's up, tribe? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the TFC Audio Project Down Under. In this episode, I chat with Mick Breen, who is a myotherapist and a TFC foot nerd based in Melbourne. We recorded this while visiting Mick at CrossFit Soul Rebel in Thornbury, which was the location for our feet balance and play workshop, as well as Mick's natural running workshop, which we discussed throughout the episode, along with some important concepts around rehab and therapy, strength and conditioning, and movement nutrition. This week's episode is brought to you by TFC Events. We're stoked to be finally getting down to Hobart to kick off our Tasmanian tour for our first ever events down there, where we'll be rolling out our brand new Ground Up Seminar that will be a full day, full body experience covering the foundations of human movement and exploring physical connection through play. That same weekend, we'll also be running our Feet Balance and Play Workshop before we head off to Adelaide for the following weekend and then to Perth. We love connecting with our TFC community wherever we go, so please, if you do live in one of these cities, get in touch, and we hope to see you at one of the events. To grab yourself a ticket to the workshop or the seminar, head to tfc-shopaus.com. All right, so Mick, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, it's actually really good to be back in Melbourne finally. It's I realised it's been since before COVID started, 2020. Yeah, I was, February, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. we were down here with Nick from Canada. And um, yeah, obviously then everything hit the fan. And we're finally back after another reschedule as well because of COVID. Um, <laughs> good old COVID. <laughs> yeah, but it's really good to be back down and reconnecting with the Footnote gang down here. We've got such a strong community of foot nerds in Melbourne. So I really love coming down here. And um, we've got... A fair few podcasts lined up over the weekend, but you're the first one, so special. <laughs> I'm not sure what order we'll release them, so this might be like the yeah, fourth yeah. or whatever. But um, So I figured we could just start with you telling us about yourself, um, what you do, why you do it from a personal or professional point of view or, or both, um, and then, yeah, hit us with that. Yeah, cool. So um, I am a myotherapist here at Melbourne Soft Tissue Therapy, got my own little business start up here a couple of years ago um, located within my brother's CrossFit gym CrossFit Soul Rebel here in Thornbury in Melbourne um, I also coach downstairs so the two jobs work really well together just um, being able to see the way clients move humans move and then if they're coming upstairs for treatment it just really sinks in well to like oh I know how you squat oh I know how you press overhead so it's better for the client to for me to know how they move instead of just put them on the bed and like, right, let's just work this shoulder or this knee injury. Like for humans, we need to know how to move. And the problem is most of us have grown up not knowing or being taught how to move. So the beauty of having those two jobs come together, it just, it makes the job so much easier. Like I try and make my my job as a myotherapist the easiest way possible, just getting people back to what we should normally be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And with most people in their sedentary lifestyle the poor shoes they're wearing just the poor habitual movement hygiene they've got in general we get into all these wacky positions and we're just tired as hell we're stressed as hell and the body just cannot cope so instead of trying to label all these people with certain injuries or certain itises or syndromes and that let's just get your back moving the way you're designed because that's the most optimal way basically humans want to move and um big thing i've learned over the past few years especially through training is like we get injured in the places we don't train Mm -hmm. most people they're trying to press something overhead they're going to hurt themselves because they don't press anything overhead they never put their shoulder in that full range of motion like we're all designed to use this full range of motion but most of us just can't find it because they've never accessed sorry assessed can't believe speak accessed (laughs) it since they were a toddler yeah because i think one of the biggest crimes for most humans is that the age of five, you're given a full-time desk job. You go to school. It's madness. Sit it down, shut up, don't move. And what does a kid want to do? They want to move. They want to fidget. They want to use their bodies. So you go through 18 plus years of school and then most people go on to another sit-down sedentary lifestyle job and they think that just going to the gym once, once a day for an hour is going to counteract all that. So it's all about not just treating the human, but it's also looking at their habits outside of the clinic and outside the gym and Mm. another big thing i've learned over the last year or so is yes going to the gym will help your everyday life outside of the gym but it's actually your life outside the gym will actually sorry yeah outside the gym will improve your gym because if you're sitting at a desk all day long for eight hours how is that setting you up to move some heavyish weight in the gym it just doesn't 
if you can change more in your everyday movements, standing up more, sitting down less, just putting yourself in these positions, the gym's pretty much gonna be a breeze for you. Because most people come in after a crappy long day of sitting at a desk, tight hips, they try and squat and potentially tweak their back. If they would have just been able to change a few things throughout the day, stand up a little bit more, wear a decent pair of shoes, they'd be able to use their glutes. Mm. Um, and it's crazy to think like being P- a PT now for 12 or so years, like 90% of clients who come to the gym have no idea how to use their glutes. And we got big butts for a reason. They keep us upright, they keep us moving, they keep us strong. If we didn't, we, we can use them because if we didn't use them, we wouldn't be able to stand up. But it's just having the awareness of how to use them properly, which is the biggest problem we see in most clients these days. It's crazy. Yeah. Man, you just touched on so many things <laughs> yeah. that, that resonate so hard with me. And obviously, this is why we get get along really well and, and obviously why we're both drawn to the Footnote program because of that holistic approach. And I found the exact same thing in physiotherapy. My first job out of physio was... Um, quite a manual therapy intensive physio job and you know they had a a really interesting method which I think was in many ways ahead of its time when it comes to manual therapy Um, but it was in a clinic room and we didn't have access to a gym we had a a quote-unquote gym which was just a small Mm -hmm. space that didn't really have any equipment or it was just it's not quite a gym (laughs) we called it the gym space yeah it was a little space Um, but what you said about having having that cross between the two so you're a PT strength and conditioning coach and a myotherapist Mm -hmm. and having that cross between and being able to look at someone's movement and then fit that into the context of what issues they're experiencing and what you know muscles are tight and or um, what range of motions are restricted that is the real key to having a good outcome is is the mixture of both because you could, and, well, actually, the mixture of that and also all the lifestyle things you mm-hmm. mentioned. And so that was a big uh, big moment for me in my career, when, especially when I started reading a lot of Katie Bowman and Kelly Starrett and just understanding that all of these people were coming in to see me with these issues that stem really from the same greater root cause, which is either a lack of movement or a lack of movement variability, lack of load over time. And there I am sort of, quote unquote, fixing them with my hands or taking away their symptoms, which was amazing, but then not really addressing the, the other lifestyle factors around it. So um, I think it is, that is so powerful to have that set up. And I know that's becoming more and more common in the industry, which is really great. Or maybe that's just because I'm surrounding myself <laughs> exactly, by the people yeah. who do that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I guess what's interesting is I'd, I'd be interested to hear because you're a myotherapist um, and I've done myself, I've done a lot of manual therapy, like I said, in, in the past. Um, but I'm interested to hear about your experiences with clients. So like there would be some people who there, there is a, a camp that's like you should never lay hands on someone. You should only get them moving and assess their movement and strengthen them and so on. And then there's a camp that says I can fix people with my hands. <laughs> hmm. um, I'd be interested to see, I'm oh, just interested to hear a bit more about how you've, what you've experienced maybe with a specific client or just generally with the overlap between them, um, between sort of using them both in tandem. Yeah, so I think in general, I don't think I've got any specific um, clients that come to mind right now, but there is either ends of the scale there. Like, I honestly don't believe that you can't touch people, like you need to touch people. It's, it, the biggest thing about that is the human touch. Mm, yeah. We crave human connection. And just having a simple touch on someone's muscle can have a res- really good um, response to it. So if that helps straight away. Um, but y- you can't just fix people with your hands. You can guide people. Like, I'm not here to fix people. I'm here to help facilitate everything else that they're doing. Yes, we can get rid of some niggles, get rid of some pains, bring down some inflammation or something like that. But if they don't then go do anything with this new movement, this new freedom, this new like less less tightness in certain areas, then it's just gonna come back to what they did in the first place. And it's not about treating symptoms. Like I've always believed that nine times out of 10, where the pain is, is never the issue. Mm. Especially with the knees, like classic with the knees, Four knee Rico's, like I know what I'm talking about. My knees were never the problem. I always give it, my favorite analogy is like, 
the knee's got the middle child syndrome. It's stuck mm-hmm. between his older brother at the hip, younger sister at the feet. Something's wrong with the foot or the ankle, knee's going to take the drama. Something's not stable with the hip, knee's going to take the drama. Or both. Exactly, or both, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is generally the case. Exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's more of me trying to educate the clients on, all right, why have we got here? I mean, yes, you can have some trauma to smash an ankle, smash a knee. That's going to happen. But like I say, 90% of the time, all these injuries are preventable. Going back to what you said with Kelly Starrett, like he was the one who really got me into the whole mobility side of things. Like I, I watched every single one of his 365 uh, YouTube videos for your own uh, at-home mobility. Every human has the right to perform their own mobility and routine at home to look after themselves. Um, and Kelly Starrett has just been the, literally the god of all of that and I follow a lot of his stuff and it makes so much sense like too many people today just rely on their their physio their Maya their Cairo to just please fix me I can help you I can't fix you you can only fix yourself like you're the only one in control of that we can prescribe corrective exercises all day long to the cows come home if you don't do them it's not going to change but it's, again it's not all just doing these exercises it's changing habitual movements throughout the day it's sitting down less it's standing up more it's Mm -hmm. taking your shoes off more it's going for a walk instead of a drive just little one percenters each day that's going to get you moving more getting blood flow getting awareness of muscles because another big thing i've learned recently um most people are just so disconnected from their bodies and that can lead you down a path of just not liking your body and like we have a big mental health problem in the world today and people without the connection of the body you don't feel good about your body if you can start using your body turning on muscles that you've not felt before i mean how good does that feel how good does get a pump in the gym feel that's why arnie schwarzenegger always said just get a pump on he loved the pump (laughs) and it's just it makes so much sense and when you can start getting that pump on feed the right muscles use your body the way it's designed you feel so much better your sense of self goes through the roof your sense of well-being goes through the roof just by knowing how to use your body and the majority of us just don't know how to use it and it's sad for sure again so many things touched on there (laughs) but what i really like there and what i've found to be very important and powerful in my own practice um is that concept of education so whether it's you're using movement or whether you're using myotherapy um or you know or manual therapy uh, or whether you're using both it all comes down to whether you're educating the client or the person in a way that empowers them to be in control of their own health, their own movement and their own rehab and their own life. Because you're really, you're really right that, that there is such or there has been traditionally such uh, a move in the opposite direction uh, in terms of passive therapies and surgeries and pharmaceutical drugs and all of these symptom management things where we tell people that oh you've got this because it's genetic or you've got this because of that and all we can do is this passive therapy and if you don't do that then you know you're just going to live in pain Mm. whereas this move whether it is with manual therapy or movement or both um, this move towards an empowering narrative and changing people's stories so that they actually go, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm in control here. And then they realize just how good it feels to be in control and just how good it feels to move and to strengthen and to you know, build a bit of intensity and, and to even to change their relationship with pain where usually people would be avoiding pain at all costs because there's, they've just been told that pain is this thing that they have to kill and pain is the enemy and and all of this and obviously pain is well maybe not obviously to some people but pain is a is a a call for change or it's a feedback it's a form of feedback and it's there to help you and if we work with that pain and sometimes work through a little bit of pain in Mm -hmm. certain contexts then people can regain that power and just even that in itself is psychologically linked with so much such better outcomes and the the belief in yourself and the belief that you can change is actually the biggest predictor of a good outcome Mm -hmm. Um, and they find that time and time again in research and and all of these other psychosocial factors like your relationship with your practitioner um, and the confidence that the practitioner has in their modality is a bigger indicator of outcome than that the modality itself exactly yeah and and so 
It is. It's it's very important, and that mental health issue you talked about is huge as well because people have this idea that there's physical and then there's mental and they're separate. And you have to work on them separately. And if you've got a mental health issue, you know you've got to do meditation and positive thinking and all of these things that are really great. But oh, you know, it's separate to the body. But yet again, time and time again, research shows that exercise is just as good, if not better, than antidepressants. And it doesn't have all the other side effects. In fact, it has a lot of good <laughs> other side effects in all other areas of your life. And so, yeah, I think, I think what you touched on is just is super powerful. And, and to be able to work with someone one-on-one and cha- gradually, because it doesn't happen overnight, but gradually Personal change right. their narrative and then get them more in control is um, such an important thing. Yeah, like it reminds me of a few times it's happened in the past since being a personal trainer for so long. Like you see a lot of young, shy, insecure girls come into the gym and like they're so intimidated when they first start and so quiet, don't want to speak, really speak to anybody and they just do what they're told and everything. But then you get six months down the line, 12 months down the line, it's a completely different person. They're loud, they're bubbly, they're swearing, Mm. they're giving you lip back at you and it's like, there's the girl. They're like they've they've come out of the shell. They've they've been given the opportunity to, to opportunity to use their body, to use themselves, to use their own health in a way that empowers them. And mm. it's such a cool feeling. And like you don't even see it in gradual stages. Suddenly, like oh, there she is. I found her. Um, and it's the beauty of movement. And it's the beauty of creating awareness in people's bodies that we can do pretty cool things as humans. But most of us don't know what to do with it. Yeah, I, I find that as well. And it's something I really try to get across in workshops and just in any interaction that to anyone that will listen to me, basically. <laughs> um, it's just how epic the human body is. Like we mm. are the most complex and adaptable movers on the planet. And that's why we got to where we are, because we are able to move in so many different ways, both on big global, in a big global sense in terms of, you know, running, jumping, climbing, swimming, all of these things that you won't, generally you won't see most animals do very efficiently. Mm. Um, But also all the fine motor skills, working with technology, making fire, cooking, and all of these things basically accumulated to make us the dominant species on the planet for better or for for worse. Um, But just just to really tap into that appreciation of, hey, my ancestors, if you look back at your lineage, my each one of my ancestors, at least for the, the bulk of our evolution, was an extremely capable, complex and adaptable mover that overcame the struggles of living and surviving in a natural environment and was able to pass on their DNA so that I can be here. Mm-hmm. And to appreciate that fact and then to just really go deep into the gratitude, because it is, it is hard to find gratitude in your body especially if you're riddled with pain and I've, I've experienced it myself with chronic pain where it's very frustrating and depressing to not be able to do simple things like squat down mm-hmm. or go to the park and run around and chase a frisbee or anything like that and you're just like what's wrong with my body like why is it why is it doing this to me and why um why can't I do these simple things I'm young I'm reasonably athletic or, or whatever or maybe you know I'm whatever age you are but it, you just get this sense of like oh it's this it's really hard and you get frustrated with your body but then if you can switch that and go my body is a an adaptable moving machine mm-hmm. i'm getting this feedback what can i do with it i know i know it can heal it's not only a moving machine it's a healing machine mm. even more it's even better than a machine <laughs> um <laughs> but it's you know it's made to heal and and to move what can i do what 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 feedback can I get and how can I work with that feedback so that I can actually yeah, express the potential, like you said, because yeah. there is so much potential in the body. Oh, and there's always an answer. Yeah. There's things, people go down so many different roads of doctors, drugs, surgery and that, but you're going down the wrong pathway. And mm-hmm. like, I honestly believe with 99% of pain, there is a better way. It's just exploring things that you haven't been taught before and finding out th- new things and trying new things. And yes, it is tough with chronic pain and you've had it for years and years, which I understand, but there's probably a few things you still haven't tried. There's always something new and mm-hmm. it is, can be very simple. Yeah. Because um, the amount of people I've had come in, like headaches is a big thing. A lot of people suffer with headaches and migraines and stuff and absolutely debilitating. And it can literally come down to one tight muscle. And let's just change a few things at home, 
get you off the out of the desk, out of the computer. Let's get you standing up right. Bit. De- yeah, distressing, and um, it's amazing what a bit of work can do, mm. and just the new the pathway you can show people with just a little bit of manual therapy, a little bit of education on your everyday habits. New world. Yeah. Yeah, and the, that's an interesting point and that I do like talking about this concept of these passive versus active therapies and how obviously traditionally there has been such a focus on surgeries, pharmaceuticals, um, manual therapy with, with the educate like the narrative of we're fixing your tight muscles or we're you know, fixing your pain. Um, traditionally there has been such a focus on that and I think there is a role there is a role for those passive therapies with the right narrative and and certainly the longer you leave an issue the more likely you are to spiral down this negative cycle to the point that you may need for some people you may need surgery and I think that's a lot less people than is than who are being operated (laughs) Um, but you know I've worked with I've worked in um, uh, chronic back pain rehab with a neurosurgeon up in Brisbane, Dave Johnson, and he he runs a program called Neurofit, which is which um, I'm not sure if you're aware of him. No, um, I'm not actually. But he, he also has a gym called CrossFit Neuro. Oh wow! And um, so we were doing back pain rehab programs with these people, just the worst of the worst when mm. it comes to back pain. Like I'd never experienced people in that debilitating level of back pain because those are the people that go and see a surgeon. And his whole thing was, let's avoid surgery at all costs. But there are there were some people that w- he would he would need to operate on, and I would experience that those people who he selected could still get a really good outcome. But the narrative was, if we do this surgery, then we get you back building function, learning mm. you know good efficient movement patterns, and exposing yourself to load. Um, because otherwise, if you just have a back surgery or any kind of surgery and then you go, okay, now that's it. And now yep. I rest for six weeks because my arm's been or my back's been, you know, cut open. Um, then you're probably going to end up with the same issue or other issues in other areas of the body. Um, and certainly you won't end up with a level of functional capacity that you want to express in your daily life. And so I think, again, it comes back down to the narrative, but acknowledging that for some people those passive modalities can be really helpful in combination with the active approach and totally, um, the empowering approach which mm. i guess is the whole point of what you do and and um exactly and what i've done in the past with physio practice um, yeah and there's definitely not one way fits all yeah yeah, yeah. exactly mm. yeah it's it's got to be individualized and and i think that's something that probably gets I mean, it, it's getting a lot more airtime, obviously, <laughs> a it lot is, yeah. more. But it, it can tend to get forgotten, especially in in certain practices where I think health as a business is an interesting concept, which actually we could get on now. But where cer- certainly traditional practices and maybe traditional health businesses have their business systems set up, and and they sort of rely on certain ways of doing things that keep the income coming in and they don't really have the it can be very challenging for them to change their practices or change their own narrative about how they practice Mm -hmm. um, because of the financial burden or the financial pressure that's on them to practice in a certain way exactly or the i guess the expectations that their patient or client base have based on how they've been practicing forever you know say if for example for a podiatrist they prescribe orthotics to 90% of the people they see for argument's sake I don't I don't you know it's going to vary yeah um but orthotic prescription is a big part of their business model and you know some so then their patient base and the, and the population in general have this idea that if I've got foot pain I go to a podiatrist and they give me orthotics that fixes my foot pain mm-hmm. and then then the podiatrist hears something else say from the foot collective or from andy or you know from the natural podiatry society that says actually we could um avoid a lot of orthotics through strengthening and mobilizing the feet and teaching the feet how to work well with the rest of the body like the hips and mm-hmm. and the core and so on and then they go ah oh, can that be true yeah. maybe but oh, but good. now all my client now this person comes to me and they uh-huh. want orthotics and i give them exercises 
and they're like, oh, just give me the orthotics because I know the orthotics is what gonna fix is what gonna mm. is what is gonna fix me. And then it's just this catch twenty two, which is a real challenge. And obviously, that's an example in podiatry, but that would go for a lot of different health businesses. Um, yeah, I'd say a similar experience you see with a lot of people is they get lower back pain. You know, a lot of people get lower back pain, and the the common thing to do is go to your GP, see what they say, and say, "Oh, just take some anti-inflammatories, have a rest." The thing that really irks me is like, why are these GPs not referring to specialists? Exactly. Some are starting to, which is really cool, but again, majority they just want to give you the drugs. Most most people just want the drugs. And then they get told to rest, which is probably two of the worst things you possibly do, and it yeah. doesn't fix it. And then they get the pain again. Oh, I just got to get more drugs. Mm. So it's with the whole health system. Like, there's so many modalities out there for you to go help fix yourself, facilitate yourself. Um, they need everyone needs to work together. You know, we're all in the same industry. Yeah, we're trying to help people out of pain. Yeah, and like with going with the podiatrist, like these guys who are prescribe orthotics like they're not doing this to hurt people no it's no, the education no, no. yeah their heart's in the right place exactly absolutely they want to help people they mm. want to help people address the problem that they came in with and they have a certain way of doing that that they've found works for them at least in at least to reduce pain and the person's come to them with pain and they've, they've, reduced, they've the reduced the pain yeah. and so they've gone look my therapy works but if they, if they or we as a collective as of health practitioners look at it from a more bird's eye view as not just pain but function and happiness and mental health and all of these different mm-hmm. things that matter so much for the overall health of someone, um, we could make a really big change. And it's not about the podiatrist or the doctor knowing everything about exercise prescription, which is no. what you were touching on is... It's just about being aware that those things are really important and knowing, having a, having a connection with or multiple connections with different people who they can prescribe or refer to um, in the context that they are dealing outside, dealing with something outside of their scope of practice mm. or their expertise. And that's, I guess that's really what we're trying to do with the Foot Collective is we now have this awesome community of podiatrists, physios, myotherapists, EPs, PTs, movement coaches, um, naturopaths, and all of these people that are on the same wavelength about the holistic health of a human, and but with different expertises in different areas, who that who we can sort of cross cross pollinate, and then those people have connections, you know, in who aren't foot nerds, but it's it sort of gives you this community of people who who you sort of who are vetted and who you know are on that same page. Mm. Yeah, and like I speak to it with my, my brother and my sister a lot, like the coaches here at the gym. And, um, you know, as coaches, we probably see these people more than anything, mm. more than your doctor, more than your therapist, Absolutely. more than your physio. Um, but we they don't have the education to come to us in a way that, yeah, there's stuff actually we can do a lot more of because we see you most days. We see how you move. We know you as people. You know you as friends. We build rapport with you. You got a bit of pain. Oh, I've got to go to physio. I've got to go to doctors. Um, and it's just the way we're taught is like I've got a alien. I've got a pain. I've got I've got to go to this one. I've got foot pain. I've got a podiatrist. I've got back pain. I'll go to um, the doctor to get the drugs, whatever. But it's slowly starting to change. It's like right, all right, you're getting back pain. Like we don't necessarily need to go get therapy. Like we just need to work out why we're getting that back pain. And again, it comes down to using of the glutes, or you're not getting you right core working or something so it's amazing what just a simple coach can do for you or, or you're not sleeping well you know it's like or all you're of that too stress and exactly the, the like you said the opportunity to connect with someone on a deeper level to really understand what's going on in their life mm. and or to just be able to ask those questions in a comfortable way and to acknowledge the the link between poor sleep and high stress and lack of movement variability or sedentarism with back pain and sometimes it is something they're doing in the gym technique wise that you can tweak and sometimes it's like well if that's not working yeah maybe you should think about all these other things and that's i loved i saw on your um outside before when uh we were filming with mac that um you've got those 
plaques, I guess you'd call them, yeah. <laughs> um, little posters, well, big posters um, that go, that talk through the five elements of health yep. and um, the core values of, the, you know, your gym. And, and it's just, it's just really cool to see that in a facility like this. Um, yeah. And it's like, so important. Exactly. Yeah. And like the facilities like this, like there needs to be more of them. Like it's the community. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's one of the big reasons why I moved down from Melbourne to be involved in this because it is the community and that's like a big thing that my brother and sister-in-law have created and that's what got us through COVID. We had that community to start with which helped the gym get through COVID situation because we could, we, yes, they're our clients and we're the coaches, but they're friends. Yeah. Like we know about their movement, but we also know about the kids. You know, they ask about the kids and they know about our lives and it's that community, it's that tribe is that whole collective of people you come together is like we can help you with this but then we're also talking about this because we've got good report with you we can say oh how'd you sleep last night mm. oh how's, how's your nutrition going and someone they come oh can they give me a bit of help with nutrition yeah cool sweet go do this yeah it's amazing just that how that tiny community can really make a massive difference and it, that can be even more powerful than going and seeing a sleep therapist or a nutritionist or something like that sometimes it is as simple as just Someone who you have good rapport with asking, oh, how's this going? And then you go, oh, I might need a bit of help with that. And then, you know, obviously some people do need to see a specialist for that. But sometimes it is just bringing a bit of awareness and going, oh, actually, yeah, no, I can. There's a few things I can change that I know that will help. Mm. Um, but like you said, the community aspect of it is is probably even the biggest thing. Like the, there's obviously the aspect that you have good rapport and, you know, you're on this sort of good friendship level with the people in your community where you can ask questions about their health but even just the fact that they belong to a community mm. is a huge determinant of their health and we, we did a whole uh, podcast on this um, a few episodes ago called tribe about yep. tribe and there's so much research in fact the the longest research study ever done on humans by harvard has shown that they've tracked these a huge group of men across 70 oh it's now 80 years wow. and out of everything, including nutrition and sleep and stress and all of this, the biggest determinant of health was their relationships and the quality of their relationships. And totally agree. It's yeah. and it is so huge and, and and obviously a lot of research showing that social isolation is one of the leading causes of death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the same, it's the equivalent of smoking fifteen cigarettes a day, they yeah, reckon, wow. in terms of how much it raises all cause mortality. And that is just, I think it needs to be talked about a lot more. And the days of going to the gym, plugging your headphones in and walking on a treadmill should really be over. And It yeah. really should. Like, they are just the worst places ever. <laughs> yeah. It's soul-sucking. It really is. I can't is. step foot in one of those gyms no, anymore. I don't remember the last time I was in one. <laughs> yeah. I really don't. But it also, it, it also um, connects to in the clinic as well because a lot of my clients are now friends. Like, we know each other because... Some clients come in and they just lay on the table and they don't say a word, which is perfectly fine. Some people just need to tune out. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. But if we start talking, we get to know each other, we build rapport, they start to trust me. Pain starts to go down yeah. magically just, <laughs> just with building that rapport. And then the, they're trusting you more than they're going to do more. They're going to listen to you more. They're going to do the exercises for you because you've built that rapport. And it's not just another human being. I'm not just looking at a subject on the table. I'm looking at a, a human being who needs help in other ways. And mm. that's what I'm here for. So like building that relationship, having that community of just having them come in every, every week or every other week or so and like excited to be here to work on it. You work together. It's not me just trying to fix you here. We're going to help facilitate each other to get there together. Yeah. It's massive. Yeah, it is huge. And, and there is a lot of power of, power in having the time like a lot of people just don't get listened to properly i think you know like no. they they just go to work and have it they don't have that sort of quality interaction with someone one-on-one -on -one. and it is one thing to come to a community gym like this and interact with a group and that is so powerful in so many ways but then also to have a practitioner like you or you know someone who cares who will actually just listen to them for an hour mm. and sometimes the table can be the best it really place is. for that yeah. like it like the manual therapy cops a lot of flack but often you know it is better to be talking to someone while doing stuff to them and touching them and and creating that rapport through that 
that modality, but also getting a lot of stuff out of them while they think they're just being worked on. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it is, it's finding that balance between the two, which it sounds like you're doing really well. Yeah, and um, I've had so many amazing conversations on that table with clients. Mm. And like even that first week after coming out of stage four lockdown where I had 40 clients, I had 40 different conversations about COVID, yeah. isolation and Trump. <laughs> and it was amazing to see True. different points of views everything, thing and it, it helped me as well because like I'm the one also talking to these people and like they're loading off onto me and I'm sometimes I'm loading onto them and it's because you got that rapport and it's it's amazing the results you can get with someone when you've got that deep connection mm. it's really cool mm. and again that's well researched it's, mm. it's very very well researched that that rapport and and um therapist what's the, is a word for it um therapeutic alliance yeah, is cool. the word used in the in the literature um that is just shown to be very very important for the outcome of the patient and obviously if you can use that therapeutic alliance to then empower them with active treatments and active mm. approaches then it's a win-win because you know obviously there's a lot of people who have a therapeutic alliance that then give people this sort of fixed mentality where they have to keep coming back to them to be fixed. Yes. Whereas it, the same thing could be happening where they keep coming back, but instead of being fixed, it's keeping accountable to the, the changes that they've decided they want to make or making tweaks to the, um, to the areas that they want to make tweaks to. And um, I think that's, that's something you were saying uh, before we started the podcast is that was a shift in mindset for you um, mm. when it came to your your practice yeah for sure because i remember when i first started getting into this business like i just wanted to fix people mm. like i didn't want to see you more than three times if i've not if i do then it feels like i've failed um and to be honest it's not the very best kind of business model for myself and when you're running your own business like you kind of want your clients to be coming back and it's not that you're trying to get them back just because you want them to spend money on you it's like oh there's so much we can work on like i've yet to meet, meet someone who's not in pain in some kind of area like you can there's a few muscles on the body you could press on 99 percent of people and they'll tell you get the hell off me mm -hmm. um there's always something to improve on just like in the gym there's always something to improve on just like in your health there's always something to improve on so building that trust and relationship and rapport with your client you can have a client for life yeah um they're paying you money but they want to they they see value in you. Like you're creating this value for them. They're not just coming just to get a rub down or anything. They're getting so much value out of it. It's not just, oh, just just massage this out of me. It's like, no, like, why is this this? this? What can yeah. we do here? Oh, just research this thing about sleep the other day. I did this this other day. And like, they're getting so much more than just a treatment. And it can be such an opportunity for someone because say someone keeps coming back, oh yeah, my calves are really tight. Um, and, they, and like, obviously you'd be giving them education along the way, but some people can be resistant to it different ideas such as barefoot or barefoot shoes mm -hmm. and say someone keeps coming back with these tight calves like yeah i want to work on these tight calves and it's like it's a great opportunity to say look you keep having these tight calves no matter how often i release them they're probably going to keep coming back unless something changes in your daily life and mm -hmm. then you can ha have that conversation about barefoot or barefoot shoes and or similarly with hips i mean so many people everyone has tight hips everyone like oh yeah my hips are so tight yep. it's like you're sitting in one position all day. Obviously, they're going to be tight. Yeah. And so it is, I think a lot of, there is a, like I was saying with the podiatrist example, there is this expectation from the community or, or the population in general that I go and see someone, they loosen me up and I feel better. And yes, that can happen and you can fulfill that expectation, but when then you fulfill it with, yeah, like with the context of, we, we don't have to keep working on this problem specifically if you change these things and mm. then we can keep, then you, then you get a, I like the, you know, then you get more of a progress step by step by step rather than step forward, step back. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you want, you want progress. Like you can keep seeing someone, like you said, for life and they could keep progressing and, and it's not always going to look linear. No. Um, and obviously some people are going to, you're going to have step backs here and there, but you don't want to be going constantly step forward step back step forward mm. step back and it's yeah maybe you may might make the same amount of money but it's nowhere near as fulfilling as for you and it's nowhere near as fulfilling for the client and both of you kind of feel like you're banging your head against the wall mm, exactly yeah. yeah yeah so it's just um 
it's, it's again it's the education yeah like there will always be something to work on and it's no no one human has reached their full optimal potential let's find some more potential in you like especially a lot of people who come to the gym is like everyone wants to improve at the gym there's always something to do you can go faster you can lift heavy you can get into a better position so let's work with that like you work with their their desires mm. and like i can help you get there cool let's ha- let's let's show you how you do it yeah and so in, in that sense it's pretty cool because you do you having a clinic set up on top of a gym mm. you get access to this community of people who are already i guess already biased to that way of thinking like oh yeah i want to improve in the gym so this makes sense that i should improve this range of motion or this control of this joint so that i can improve this movement in the gym mm. but equally you have people that come in maybe who aren't members of the gym and just saw you on instagram or you know found you some other way and then you have the opportunity to go let's load this new range of motion in the gym mm. and then that can then get them into oh the gym oh that this is cool i like the feeling of exercising and moving i like the community aspect and then suddenly they're in the community and they've got a, a, a group of people around them that care for them and they have something that they belong to so it's it works both ways yeah it's funny like with clients who do come from external to the gym like they've got to walk past the gym up the stairs and all mm. of them, when they're going back down the stairs or up, they they peek in. They go, oh, that looks really cool. It's like, yeah, it is. Yeah. And there's been several clients who've come outside of the gym through me and now with clients of the gym. So it's great. And I can honestly say I never want to have the clinic leave the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, I want the clinic to grow and get a bit bigger, but I want to do it within a gym because it's the best one-stop shop for the, the human body and the, the potential we can get out of people. So it Absolutely. just works so well together. Yeah. And let's talk a bit about the, I guess, the approach of your gym. Like, obviously, it's a CrossFit affiliate. Um, you were talking to me a, a while back. We were having a chat on the phone. Is it Strong First? Strong Fit. Strong Fit. Yeah. Yes. Tell me a bit about, like, your general approach with, like, CrossFit as a whole here. Is it different to other CrossFit gyms or is it... Um, I'd say, yes, we are a little bit different. Like, yes, we're a CrossFit gym. We love the CrossFit style of training. But the way we've... Um, my brother and sister-in-law, like they've got such a bigger holistic approach to training. And my brother is heavily involved with the strong fit side of things. And um, the stuff that they're doing with movement, fitness, health, anxiety, everything is just game changing. Mm. And with my brother being one of the mentorees of the strong fit um, program, some of the things they're coming out with is just game changing. Like we we play a lot with sandbags which are a lot more natural functional movements Mm -hmm. um one of the i remember going going to the first strong fit seminar and just mind blown i've never been engaged to a full two days in so intensely in my life because it was just knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb and one of the cool things that came out of it was so many people have a squat problem but it's more of a barbell problem humans have been squatting for years and years and years thousands of years was been squatting with rocks sandbags you name it in front of us the barbell got invented about 150 years ago Mm. then we start getting problems yeah because as soon as you put when do we ever load our spine in the bottom of a squat yeah never and you think about if you've ever done a back squat putting the bar on your back the things you've got to think about to do a good squat you pick up a heavy object like a sandbag bear hug it you just squat yeah and the right muscles work it's crazy and I've not seen anybody hurt themselves squatting a sandbag. Mm. It's just and like another example with bench press. So many people have internally rotated shoulders from our good old desk um, posture and all that. And you're benching with a barbell and you're basically pressing straight up and down. Now your pec major is an internal rotator of the shoulder. When you're benching with a barbell, like it's not really engaging the big part of your pec. Mm. And so many people are just benching with their traps and their delts. You grab a sandbag. The only way to grab it is to squeeze your hands in, which brings the pecs on, and you just go and it absolutely annihilates your pecs. It's the best way to build strong pecs. And the problem is most people just don't know how to use their pecs. Like I say it to a lot of clients, and it's a funny question, but it's like, can you make your pecs dance? You know, they think it's just a party trick, but it's actually the sign of a healthy shoulder. Yeah, because everything we do in front of us with our arms pressing in front of us pressing above us 
is from our pec. It's a big muscle. Why do you think everyone's got tight traps? Because we don't know how to use our pecs. Yeah. Um, so the strong fit side of training is so cool. Um, the way my brother puts it into our programming alongside the CrossFit stuff, we work with the nervous system. We work with different ranges of intensity. Like There's some workouts that can last no more than 30 seconds, which absolutely annihilate you. But it's teaching you how to be intense. Use that intensity to the absolute extreme because through everyday life, like most of us are stressed, we're tired, overworked, and we kind of, we're just flown along, not quite knowing what to do. So being able to actually just push yourself to the absolute maximum and just be on the floor for the next 10 minutes, we need to do that. We need to get mm. that the system working. Um, and on the other end of the scale, like because a lot of us are so just go, 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 we're stuck in that sympathetic nervous system where it's just fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. We don't know how to relax. We don't know how to calm our s s nervous system down and actually use it. So we do workouts where it's like, right, let's just stick with all nasal breathing, calm the system down and just push your threshold to where you just need to, where you're just testing that nasal breath. But we're doing a bit of cardio, we're still moving. We're building up our lower threshold of cardio because most people go to the gym, the gym, they just want to go, 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 go. Mm. That's cool. You can't do that every single day. Yeah. You need to take the load off, calm down and be in control of your body, like we said before. Um, because when you can actually control your breath through your nasal breathing, you control your heart rate, you actually recover so much quicker. Um, you feel a lot better. You don't wake up sore the next day. I mean, I'm sure everybody's been in this position where they're in the workout where they've just lost their heart rate, their breath is all over the place, and they're ruined. They can't continue. They've lost control of their body, where if you stick with that nasal side of things, working on keeping that nervous system under control, you're in control of that situation, and you can push harder. You can bring it back. It's really just we love to teach you how to use your body. Like, yes, you're coming here, and we're telling you what to do, but we're helping you work out how to do it. It's like, it's not like, oh, can you feel this? No, like, oh, what did you feel? Cool. That was what we wanted to feel. It's empowering them to use the body the way they can, they're designed. Um, and like the strongest philosophy around it all is just, again, it's mind blogging the way we can just, the way of finding certain muscles that haven't been found before and using the nervous system the way it is designed, getting people out of that fight or flight going between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic mm. um, but then also going into your nutrition like they've got a whole side of nutrition which we won't go into right mm. now but it's just fascinating to see what they're doing with their education and knowledge around the body and you see it in um, after some sessions like that even after the, the long steady nasal breathing sessions like all the clients are just social as anything mm. because they're not flat on their backs they don't want to just get out of there. They want to hang around because they're feeling good. Yeah. And it's all about just empowering people to feel good about their body and moving. And getting both ends of those spectrums, I think, is so important because there's the challenge. There is the challenge of going all out and just, you know, just pushing yourself to your max. And I think it's it is there is definitely a role for that. But then na people are often very surprised just how challenging it is to just stick with nasal bruising and do, do some simple movements, even it's unloaded hard. movements. It's, it's tough, yeah. especially if you're used to just relying on your mouth. It, it is a lot harder, but you do become more efficient. And then that's what allows you to be to push even harder when you are doing the mm. max efforts and to be even safer when you are doing the max efforts. And I think getting those two ends of the spectrum is just so important. And I think that's where CrossFit Maybe especially in its early days, I don't, I don't really know a huge amount about the way a lot of pro CrossFit gyms practice these days, mm -hmm. but it did cop a lot of flack um, for just going, for getting people to just do intense workouts every day because it was, it was sort of, it, the pendulum swung in the opposite direction. We're like, we need to get intensity, we need yeah. to get community, we need to get competition, yeah. and it just went a little too far in that direction. There wasn't the education back then, unfortunately. Yeah. There, was, there was no good coaches there was a few but there wasn't many mm. so like that's the problem you hear today still people are oh, not going to do cross we get injured mm. well that you know you can there's still bad coaches out there there's yeah. bad therapists out there. there's bad every industry but crossfit has evolved to be one hell of a just a sport in general it has improved so many other sports like the biggest thing i love about crossfit is has now allowed women to be strong mm. it's mm. it's allowed them to have muscle to lift heavy weights 
and say, oh no, girls shouldn't do that. I'm like, of course they should. It's so cool seeing a girl squat clean 100 kilos. It's amazing. And CrossFit has allowed that to happen because now there's more women in sport. There's not, not sport, take that back. Um, there's always been women's sport. <laughs> um, more women in powerlifting, in yeah. strongman, in Olympic lifting. And some of the CrossFit athletes are phenomenal. Oh, Tia. Oh, example. yeah. Or, 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 uh, Aussie I mean, legend, yeah. That's a, oh, yeah, the Aussie legend. I've got to mention it. But yeah, it is phenomenal to watch. Mm. And just the... You're right, having that culture. I think that CrossFit was a huge wave through the industry of this new culture of community, gym, intensity, varied movement, and all of these things that weren't just weren't getting done and still aren't getting done in your classic big mm. box gyms. Um, yep. You know, your, your Anytime Fitness and your Good Life. Sorry to call you out, guys, but <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening. Um, but you, you, just, you just don't get anywhere near the same experience. But then I, I love this sort of... I don't know if you'd call it a new wave or a second wave or whatever, this, this, um, this ability for CrossFit or at least individual facilities to pivot and go, what are, what are our values? How do we want to approach CrossFit? Because CrossFit is a very big general term. Um, and it's a brand, really. It is, <laughs> but yeah. You, it's but a brand. It, it has general principles, but then you can work within those principles in a way that uh, matches with your values and and how you want to train clients um and how you want to run your community so i think that's that's really cool and it is it is amazing to see what you guys have done here with mm. crossfit soul rebel you guys got another place as well hey? yes yeah, soul rebel in greensboro as well greensboro, so that was okay. the sister yeah. gym that was the original crossfit soul rebel oh, right. that my brother used to train at then started coaching uh-huh. and then had the opportunity to open up this place so it's we're coming up to the eighth birthday soon eighth? Oh. yep oh, happy birthday yep, yep. <laughs> for uh yeah for when when is that Whoa, don't good know. question. Don't know. <laughs> June, I think. Yeah, it's right. around about okay. um, Close. my second birthday with Melbourne Soft Tissue Therapy. So right, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, because I mean we've had a few events here now for the Foot Collective. I think we've this had a, the third one now. Yeah, we've had a seminar and a couple of, or a few workshops yep. as well. And it's just such a good space down there. We were checking it out again, and we've got this is this podcast is two days out from our Foot Collective. Uh, Feet balance and play workshop in the morning, and then your natural running workshop in the afternoon, which is really exciting. Yep. Um, maybe we could chat a bit about that actually. Um, how your interest in running came, and and what your vision is with uh, the natural running side of things. Yeah, cool. Um, always been involved, loved running because I was pretty damn fast as a kid, a young rugby player, and injuries struck me down, and I've lost the speed. Like, there's nothing more f- having more freedom than sprinting. Like, mm-hmm. I would love to get back to it one day. Hopefully, I will. Um, but the thing is, like, running should be one of the most natural things we do as humans. Mm. But unfortunately, it's not. Um, the fact that the stats say that 80% of runners every year get injured, you know, just everyday runners, like, it's just a horrendous stat. And it's, like, m- not massive injuries. It's little strains here. It's little niggles. It's tightness and everything. But um, if 80% of injuries was in, like, football or rugby or something like that like your parents would never let you play it mm. so there's we've got to be doing something wrong we we evolved as human beings to be the most efficient running machines on the planet where did we go wrong and um you can really bring it back to um the 70s with nike when they invented the good old running shoe shoes and chairs yes <laughs> shoes and chairs that's it the sedentary life that just kills us so like i can't help but just look at people when they're running past everywhere i go just driving around it's like Oh, like there's got to be something different and started to research a bit more like uh, I um got taught from my old chiropractor back up in Canberra like he had his own way of running and brought all the different kind of running styles together and, and developed his own and helped me learn to rerun because I was always pulling my hamstring and all that and it really resonated with me with how that can help and then as I got more knowledge myself with movement and treatment and that I started to develop my own kind of workshop around it and every single time i take someone through the analysis like 99 percent of people improve it's ridiculous mm. like doing a video before and after like you'll probably see on my instagram there's so many of theirs like the transformation is insane and it's not doing much at all we are just creating awareness of how to use the body the way it was designed like like i said before we got big butts for a reason but we just don't know how to use them because we're sat on them all day long mm. like even myself, like I don't have a sit down job, but I sit in the car. I sit to watch TV, I sit to eat. We sit way too much. And 
I've struggled to find my glutes in the past because that's why I've got all the knee injuries. Um, and good question I ask a lot of people is like, do you ever feel your glutes after a run? They're like, no. Well, what do you feel? Oh, calves and quads? Well, there you go. Because <laughs> their hips are so damn tight from the sedentary lifestyle, add in the shoes, and it just promotes a poor technique where people are basically shuffling along, mm. overstriding. Um, and the crazy thing you see in a game like AFL, like they run on average 15 kilometers a game. And the biggest, the number one injury is the hamstring strain. And they're all overstriding, they're all heel striking. Like footy boots do not help that at all. Um, and so the whole thing behind the workshop and working together with the TFC is there's so much that we can pull together to help create these strong, efficient, resilient runners that can run all day long. Because like say back in our hunter gatherer days, we used to run our prey to death. Um, we evolved to be the only species on the planet that sweat to help us keep going in the sun. To, and like you'll see when your dog gets over, overheated, it has to pant all day because mm. it can't sweat. You know, humans don't pant, luckily. Yeah. Um, we sweat. Oh, you see to, some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to auto-regulate our temperature to keep us running and running mm. and running. And not many people can run very far these days. Like 50 meters kills people. So there's not much we need to do to help change it. It's just giving the education of how to lift your legs, use your glutes, stop shuffling, stop heel striking, educate on the feet and the shoes. And... It's amazing. Like the best thing I do in the workshop is after going through a lot of technique and that at the end, we kind of take our shoes off. And it's like, all right, just run. And again, 99% people, of people have done that. They're running this fix straight away. Mm. That's actually really, that's such an important point because I guess running, like you said, it is the most natural part of our human movement. We have evolved to be extremely efficient running machines. And for the bulk of our evolutionary history, we were, and that's how we... Uh, it's a big part of how we survive with hunting and so on. And so people have this view of running of like, oh yeah, I'm a human, I can just run. And they, you know, I want to get fit, I want to lose some weight, I'll go and I'll start running. And maybe <laughs> back in the days, obviously you wouldn't be getting fit and losing weight because you need to do it to survive. But back in the day, the only experience of running you've had is barefoot and watching other efficient runners run and so you get modeled and there's things in our brain called mirror neurons that essentially allow us to look at someone moving and for us to copy that without needing instruction and so if you're modeled good running technique and you don't have funny things on your feet that <laughs> affect your technique and, and or allow you to overstride, which is like the devil in running um, and you know allow you to heel strike with all this load which you could never do without shoes if you take away or if you have the presence of good modeling or let's say if you take away the modeling mm. it, uh, and take away the the watching of efficient running and you um, add in shoes then you end up with a recipe for disaster and hence all the injured runners and so like you said it it it's maybe maybe simple not easy but even it is can be quite easy depending on the person and everyone's on a different part of their journey and everyone has a different background and history with injuries and so on but a lot of it like you say is about just removing the stuff that's that's sort of allowing them to run poorly and then building up gradually mm. and let, letting people explore the technique and going, try, try this. Oh, okay, how did that feel? Try this. Did you feel the difference between that and that? And then really letting people understand their bodies. I, I'm not a running coach, but I, I see how this <laughs> applies from yeah. my own training and my own rehab and, and so on. Um, but it is, it is very exciting to, for TFC to be going down this path now because it is, I mean we're all about feet well we're all about health in general <laughs> but starting at the feet and one of the biggest things that humans do with their feet is run and so working with you and andy and and eventually turning this into a really powerful online mm -hmm. um platform and and um product for that the world can have access to um to to change those stats those, exactly those we went the stats, stats down yeah 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 it's, yeah, it's, it's very exciting, exciting times yeah because it's like like I say, I see so many people running around like, I just want to help them. I just want to stop them and be like, I right, just do this. Mm. Um, and the biggest thing behind it, like it is, it is easy to change. The hardest part is conditioning yourself to it because you've been 
most people been wearing these shoes for so long with the heel raise they've been running this way for a while so it, it's not a quick fix at all yeah. it's again educating of the movement when it'll take time yeah um and that's the hardest thing to get across to people's like yes like you can see you're running beautiful today but now go practice that this is going to take it's just like trying to transition to a barefoot shoe yeah it's a slow challenging process but if you want to do it you'll get there yeah it takes consistency exactly and and i think as well because like we said you know usually in nature you'd be walking and running all the time from day dot you don't get a chance to build up all of this tension and stiffness uh, in muscles and joints over a long period of sedentarism and so you know it's one thing for someone to witness a really good technique and to um, have cues to be to have you know certain elements of good technique but it's another thing for their body to actually be ready for the load of running and for their joints to have the mobility um, you know for instance big toe mobility or hip extension mobility to express that efficient technique because you do need both um, you know it's, you kind of need joints that function like human joints and then you layer on technique with that and then it you know you get the the best of both um, or you get the, the power of both of those combined whereas if you you know if you just have mobility and you know strength in certain joints but you don't know what you're doing with technique or you've got you know you're still over striding and everything then you're not going to have a good time no. and if you just know in theory how the technique works but you don't have the lit like the literal body capacity to express that technique then you're not going to have a good time so it's it's the marriage of both which i think is where and why that why it's shown that strength training is so good for running and and um oh, good for everything it's good for everything yeah, yeah everyone just, needs to be lifting weights yeah, yeah <laughs> just get strong or yep. is it, yeah yeah it's strong. all yeah i mean you know you could start with body weight if you're relatively weak but just finding ways to increase load over time and to be stronger and you will you, you genuinely do find that it improves all aspects of your life it really it's, <laughs> I mean, if strength training and exercise in general, but if strength training was a pill, everyone would be paying top dollar for it and everyone would be taking it. But yes. it's just not as... it's In one way, it's not as easy as taking a pill, but in another way, it's, it's so rewarding. much more satisfying. Yes, it's so sure. much more enjoyable once you find that groove. Um, so have you, have you found that as well, like in, in terms of applying strength training principles for runners? Oh, for um, sure. Yeah, yeah, because most people are weak in their calves, they're weak in their knees quads glutes you know the whole body really even the upper body like you'll be surprised how much your upper body is involved in running you know just having that core stability to keep you nice and linear not rotating through the shoulders as you run even keeping your head in the right position mm. like our posture is so pretty crap these days like we run with shit posture so the strengthening of all parts of the body just relate to the running and it's just being in sync with the body mm. um because the great thing I do with the workshop is I get people to just get down on the floor and crawl. Mm. And I'm like, mm. why are we crawling? So, well, it's the first thing you learn as a toddler. Yeah. If you're not in sync with your crawling, you're not in sync with your walking, you're definitely not in sync with your running. Yeah. So, I love getting people on the ground for yeah. that. It exposes some serious really weaknesses does. and ineffic yeah. inefficiencies. And yeah. people are so uncoordinated. It's hilarious. Yeah. So, why am I crawling on the ground? Yep. Yeah see that pattern you're doing yeah. <laughs> that's running <laughs> i went for it myself i yeah. was humbled with oh shit i can't crawl yeah 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 it's um such a big thing so i'm really excited for for the weekend to have both of those workshops on and um for us to connect as a gang the the, the footnote crew trying to get the big tribe. melbourne gang together yeah it's been far too long and um i think that's probably a good place to wrap it up but uh, next time we're down in melbourne it'd be cool to do a follow-up podcast and um, explore some more different areas and, and that'll be after we've had um, I guess a bit more uh, experience with the natural running workshops and, yep. and a bit more progress with creating this this epic online platform cool um, so yeah everyone can stay tuned for that um, but otherwise we'll catch you on the next episode <laughs>